of minutes. Should I just go ahead and start? Holy Father, we are coming more and more. Uh, it's taking a while, we, we acknowledge that, but we cannot deny that, that we are coming more and more to admire you. For there are people every day teaching us in one way or another. Uh, about who you are and what you're after. People are writing wonderful, wise, and rich things that you're enabling them to write because they're coming to know you. And there are people we know all over the place, maybe even our husbands and wives, our children and parents, and certainly our friends, who are embodying in marvelous ways your likeness. And those of us who um, regret deeply that we haven't been as pleasing to you uh, in the years that have gone by, and, and even now, we, we thank you for these people. Uh, we thank you for uh, being patient with us and loving us, we're becoming uh, more assured, not only that you love us, but uh, indeed, it is true about each of us that we do want to please you. That we know. That we know. And would you in these uh, a few moments that we're together here at this point. Would you uh, help the speaker and would you help the hearers? As you've already been uh, doing, uh, getting us ready to hear, getting us ready to speak as we have done what, uh, the, the kinds of things we have to do to do these. Thank you for drawing us all into the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for enriching us as far as we've come. And Heavenly Father, if there is someone here who is yet to complete her, their, his or her response to you uh, in your loving, gracious patience and in your relentless loving search for them, uh, would you use us, whoever we are, to um, enable them, maybe very soon, uh, to surrender the whole thing to you. That would be wonderful. We'd be happy, they'd be happy, and you would be happy. Thank you for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Um, if I'm filling with this here, Nate, it, it is what it is. Uh, but, but it's an irritation, isn't it? See him poking his finger in his ear. I'm, what do I tell you? Uh, some years back, uh, coming back from Russia, I brought uh, two of those Russian dolls, yes? And, uh, oh, just lovely things. Got one for my Ethel and got one from my sister, Annie. Annie at that time was about 82 years old. What I'm telling you is true. <laughs> what I'm telling you is true. Annie was about 82 at that time and suffered fairly markedly, yes, markedly, um, with dementia. Um, everybody nowadays that has some dementia it's Alzheimer's, you know, that's what we're told. I don't want to get on and on and off, but Time Magazine about nine months ago had a whole uh, uh, issue on it. 
and I don't remember the leading guru's name, but it, it was a lengthy job, and it was a lot of honesty about it. And the, I shouldn't even be saying this, it's not my point, but I can't help it, it's the way I'm wired. Anyway, um, the conclusion of uh, the, the whole issue was a word from the guru, the leading man in the all Simic studies and disciplines. He said two things that I'll remember well. One of them he said, it's hard to um, work to heal dementia, uh, sorry, Alzheimer's. It's hard to work with Alzheimer's to heal it when you don't know what it is, number one. Number two, he said, we've done, and this is right the concluding remarks. He said, we've done a number of autopsies, a large number of autopsies on people we said were all psychic, and we knew what the brain would look like. We went in there and it looked nothing like what we expected. Okay, so dementia's creeping up on me. I know it is. I mean, sometimes I think it's fast and sometimes I think it's slow. But whether it's Alzheimer's or not, it's there. My sister, my sister Agnes the same, and my sweet sister Margaret, who's still alive, Annie and uh, Agnes have died. And um, they died with uh, cardiac insufficiency, which not being a medical man, I think that's the answer to it. But Annie was very depressed. Live now alone, not far from her grandchildren, but her only son, the closest friend on the planet to her, Jim. Handsome fellow. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I know. But a handsome fellow. He's now late, late 58s, and they called him, his friends called him the babe. He still looked young and all of that. And he and Annie were the closest. In 24 hours, he became ill and died. And, that, and then her husband had died. And she was very dying. I'm back. I'm back on the story. I'm back from Russia. I go up to see her. She's sitting there with that kind of a dazed sort of a look. Uh, she's fed up with life. And told me that repeated, repeatedly. Want it to go. She said, I've lived long enough. Um, she had never professed to be Christ's child or anything like that, though she was a, a very fine woman. Um, but she wanted to die. She'd had enough. I didn't want to get out of bed, that kind of thing. And I'd, I'd go, and my brother also, Alec, and I would go every now and again, and we'd have to plead with her to get out of bed. Dying in the mind. When she spoke, the tone was dead. All of that, God help her. So, I go into the house. We go into the kitchen. Sit across this little table. And I said, I've got you something. Okay? I took it out of whatever I took it out of. Set it on the table. And I was waiting for her to go all, you know. She said, oh, something like this. Oh, that's nice. I said, oh, that's good, you know. I said, watch this. And I screwed off the top, yes? <laughs> Put it down, and she looked at it, and she said, oh, something like that. I can't remember verbally, but I'm, I'm telling you the essence of the conversation. She said, oh, I, oh, oh, look at that, you know, something like that. And I said, watch this. And then I screwed off another one. <laughs> and then she said, oh, dear, you know. And then I screwed off another. And the smaller they got, the more, you know. And finally, she was all, you know, bright. And then I took the last one off, and it was this little baby doll. And she looked at it, and she started laughing and clapping like a child. And it was a wondrous experience. And I hadn't seen, and I haven't seen many adults laughing like a child, even now. But I hadn't seen her like that until that moment. Thrilled she was. The dying inside, 
the deeper you went, the more and more that was revealed. And I thought of that uh, subsequent many a time. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be really interesting if you could start with a little tiny one and then get bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger, wouldn't it? <laughs> but I have thought that this is indeed what happens biblically. You get a sense of something. And then men and women, wise men and women, I've got about 7,000 of them live in my little office. And every now and again they say, I want to talk to you. So I take the book down and give it a good listening to. That, that goes on all the time. And there are people writing wonderful things, teaching us marvelous things, rich, all of that. And here you start with a little truth. Before you know it, you lift that off and it's a bigger truth. And it's a bigger truth. And it's a bigger truth. Before you know, the whole universe is filled with thoughts of him, truth about him, and the glory of him. This is who you are who pursue him in not only information, but in transformational information. You want to be like him. You don't just want to quote him, which is a lovely thing to do, as you very well know. But you want it to be your own. You want it to be him entering you. Christ dwelling in your heart by faith. That's what you want. You want to see the glory of God everywhere you look. We want to turn out to be the best lookers and seers in the world. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the glory of his garment filled the whole temple. On he go you know this is Isaiah 6. On he goes a little bit, and then he has the seraphim shouting one to another. What do they shout? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then the entire world is filled with his glory. This is in the middle of military, just wars here and everywhere. Tiglath Pileser began the Neo Babylonian Empire. He was a general that a coup took it all over. Of all the ancient empires, the most cruel, the most viciously cruel were the Assyrians. And in the year that King Uzziah died, here they come, like a, like a massive swarm of army ants all over the world. People scared spitless, as I am right this minute. <laughs> Would you please, Billy? And, and that's what Billy's here for. <laughs> that's a joke. That was a bad joke. That, that wasn't even funny. If he confesses it later. Woe is unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. With the death of Uzziah, he went into panic. Well, God rules the world, but he rules through good, big, strong men and women. No, God could rule the, rule the world through a donkey. That's what he told Nebuchadnezzar. Do you remember? And Nebuchadnezzar said, prove it. One minute he was bragging, and the next minute he's munching. See? And some guys come up from a government night and said, we would, like to speak to, um, we would like to speak to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And somebody would say, well, yeah, if you can catch him, you can talk to him. There he is. He's, what? It doesn't matter who's running the show. In the end, it's God who's running the show. And the glory, the glory of God is everywhere. We're seeing it in non-Christian people who are good surgeons, good teachers, good this, good that, good the other. We don't ask, are you premillennial or what? We don't ask them that. Oh, you're my mom. Oh, that's working well. Oh, that's a great kid, that in there. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, please. What was I saying? Have you any idea what I was saying? I know he's in Isaiah somewhere. 
Ah, the glory of God, the glory of God. You were saying how great I was. Oh, that's, how, that's what I was saying. <laughs> hey, doesn't he wish? I, I mean, yes, I was. Yes, I was, Billy. I want to say something about the righteousness of God. Look, trust me just for now and then verify later. Just trust me for now that the diakosune theu means more than one thing. There are various faces of the righteousness of God. Lots of faces to it. Words, words didn't fall straight down out of heaven. God gave us the gift of speech, however that's worked out. And I noticed that Noam Chomsky has given up his 1990 work and now says, I don't know how in the cat hair human language come up. Good for him. A smart man there. So our words, our words don't mean any one thing. The word faith and the word hope are two distinct words, but they can't exist without each other. Trust me just for now, and then later on, check it out. I'm telling you what the people are teaching me, and I, I spend a lot of time with these people, listening to them. Look, love is distinct from faith. But when we're talking about in our uh, divine narrative, they cannot be separated. They don't have one faith, one phase. Faith and hope are distinct depending on what the writer or the speaker means to mean. Yes? So when he closes out 1 Corinthians 13, and he says, but now abides faith, hope, and love. Love's the number one. When he says that, he wants to distinguish strictly between faith and hope and love. But that's not always what happens. When you speak of the love of God, you're speaking about a specific kind of response. But there is no loving response without faith. There is no loving response to the God that we are the God of without hope. So they're all connected because life is like them. Words don't mean any one thing unless it's so narrow. A chair, well, even a chair. You have baby chairs. You have reclining chairs. You have high chairs. Even the word chair has to be modified and connected. The word righteousness, the righteousness of God means. And even the word means. <laughs> he says to her, you never iron my shirts. She says to him, what do you mean I never iron your shirts? What, is she asking for information or what? <laughs> does she mean, what do you mean? Or does she mean, you jerk, you better take that back. <laughs> or something, or something like that. She's not using the word mean the way the word mean can mean. You're standing by a pool, hot summer's day, somebody throws a bucket of cold water over you, after you get over the semi-heart attack, you say, this means war. <laughs> what does she mean by the word means? You know what she means. Okay. Righteousness has a root idea. Doing what is right. Living according to a standard, an accepted measurement. That's the, the, the DK root. But once you get beyond the root, people develop different ways of using the same word. Like Paul with agape says, Demas has abandoned me. He loves the world. And the word agape there doesn't mean what he meant by it in 1 Corinthians 13. Don't trust anybody. I don't care who it is. Don't trust anybody who says to you, that word means and that's that. It means what a writer means it to mean. It means what a speaker means it to mean. Somebody 
in the office is treating everybody bad, and they want to write to the big bosses about him, but they're afraid of him finding out who is complaining, who is just doing the complaining. So they're going to write a note to the big bosses that doesn't say who it is. So I say to you, we need to, we need to, to write a, a unanimous letter to the bosses. A unanimous letter? Well, you know, I've used the wrong word, but in that sentence, the wrong word means anonymous. There's a point to that. I, I know you didn't get it. I haven't got it very well myself. I am saying, I am saying that if we're going to read scripture, we need to help one another do this. Don't get too fussy about it. Let the scholars do all the, and thank God for scholars and specialists. I couldn't read my English Bible if scholars didn't do their job. What we love the specialists, even though sometimes specialists talk nonsense, but they do well for us, and we're glad, we're glad we have them. Let all the specialists do all the lexical work and the grammatical work, all of that. But you can do all the grammar and all the lexical work and all of that and still not know what's going on. Christ in John 5, the fellows who were trilingual, Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew, he said, you're never out of the Bible, are you? You're always studying it. But you never find me in it. You don't come to me. You're missing the whole point. For all your grammar, all your linguistic ability, for all your smarts, for all your knowing canon law, you miss me. A watch isn't about figures and wheels and springs and batteries. It's about something else. You can describe a watch perfectly and never know what it's for. And if you don't know what it's for, you don't really know what it is. Biblically, same thing. The big message, central message, is that God is righteous. And, and that means what? It means all kinds of things. You want to you know what it means? Read Bart. Read Karl Bart. He'll tell you what God's righteousness is about. You want to read Boltman? Read Boltman. You want to read Kaiserman? They'll all tell you what righteousness means, and some of what they tell you will be true. Thank God. They, they, they help us. That in the end... In the end, I want to reduce Dakosune to one thing. What he talked about earlier on, Billy, I mean, by the faithfulness of God. For that, that has this coming on home close. Paul opens up the book of Romans with that passage. He's Paul, he's a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he promised aforetime by the holy prophets in the scriptures. It's about his son. The whole story is about God as he's manifested himself in Jesus Christ. You want to know what holiness is? Well, the word holy, it has a, a basic sense of difference, separateness. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. You want to know what holiness is? Well, it has, it has a, uh, a forbidding, it has a forbidding face. So it does. Exodus 19, 19 and 20. Anybody touches this mountain, says God, I want them dead. If it's an animal that touches them, dead. It has a, get off your shoes, the ground you're walking on is holy. Yes? Of course it is. It has a forbidding look. But the same God, it says, up the mountain, burning and all of that, that scared Moses spitless. He said, I'm exceedingly afraid. That same God who threatened death for animals and men who touched the mountain is the one who in chapter 25, all the way through 31, and then 35 to the end of the book, says, I would like you to build me a house. I want to live in the midst of you. And I will dwell in you. And in Leviticus chapter something, 16. No, no. Leviticus 26, 19. He said, I brought you out of Egypt unto myself with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. And I have liberated you. And I will dwell among you. 
and you will be my God, and I will be uh, whatever. You will be my nation, and I will be your God, and I will walk among you. And here, I will not abhor you. For I've lifted you up, taken the yoke off your back, and enabled you to walk uprightly. Yes, this is God. The God who has the forbidding look for good reasons, for loving reasons, then says, I want to dwell in the midst of you. You and I must tell the world that. This, look, look. God is for us. We know that. And we're grateful for it. But he is for us that he might indeed reach out into the world. Because he's for them too, as you well know. His righteousness um, is to do what is right. Holiness has that forbidding look. But it's not a stiff armed keep your distance. We meet God and we say to him, holy. Now the scholars debate about that. What is it? Well, what do you mean by holy? And he says, Watch me. Listen to me. And he points at Jesus Christ. And what happens? You know what happens. You just won't talk up. But that's okay. You watch him. What does he do? He's sweet. He hangs around the moral riffraff. He hangs around the fellows hated by the nation. And they weren't all sweet, poor little you know, Zacchaeus, they were bad guys, a lot of them. They, they sold themselves to Rome. They, they hacked people. They stole from people. They did all of that. And when, when the Lord describes the prodigal son, and uh, he makes him a bad kid. He's a spoiled brat. And then when he describes the older brother, who no doubt represents the kind of the worst kind of Pharisee, he doesn't make him look good either. So, all the publicans and the sinners that he gathered with, they weren't nice people. And yet, that's where you find him. You get into more trouble, the Lord did. Get into more trouble with the preachers. Get into more trouble with the church leaders than he ever got into trouble with anybody else. And he got into trouble because he was holy. In John chapter 6, a lot walked away. Christ said to the apostolic group, you going to leave? You remember the text. He said, no, where would we go? Uh, you only have eternal life. And he said, do you know who I am? And Peter, thankfully, said to him, yes, and following the best Greek text, he said, and the NIV follows that. Um, he said, uh, yes, we have learned that you are the Holy One of God. Holy? Take a look at him. Take a look at him. And you know what holiness is. Walking down the road with, with, with people who were outcast, putting his arm around his or her shoulder and saying, it's okay, it's all right. Put, to, uh, have, having a great time with the publicans and the sinners and the preacher guys and the church leader guys and all of those of whom he said, woe unto you scholars, you've taken away the key of knowledge. And in their case, many of them. You didn't want to enter the kingdom, and you wouldn't let anybody else enter. These were the people that Christ was savage. Not, 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 savage is a good word. Savagely opposed to, but loved them also, because he went to the house of Simon the Pharisee to eat with him as well. In Luke chapter 23, the most scathing passage in the New Testament, sustained passage. You brood of verb. What? Snakes. You're this. You're, you have no way to escape hell. All of that talk, it doesn't end the chapter that way. The chapter ends with, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, kills the prophets, stones them that are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered you like a hand gathers the chickens under her wings? And you wouldn't. And then in Luke 19, later, Luke 19, he goes in, they all say how wonderful he is. The leaders are all conniving against him. He goes up onto a hill and sits there, says the biblical text, sobbing, eyes streaming, chest heaving, heart pumping. Oh, Jerusalem, he said. If you had only known the day of your visitation, they're going to put up embankments against you. They're going to do this, that, and the other. They're going to tear you apart. Sobbing his eyes out over the people who are going to reject them. He's now on the cross, and he's saying, Father, forgive them. He's not talking about individuals 
as individuals, though it includes individuals as individuals. He's talking about this nation, which is now rejecting him, joining with the lawless ones. He acts 2.23, you by lawless anomia, you by lawless hands have crucified and slain. He's saying to his holy father, please, as if his father didn't know. He's trying, not trying to talk his father into it. He's expressing his feelings. His father feels the same way. His feelings are the feelings of his father. He's just letting it out. It's emotions being let loose. Oh, oh, I don't want this to happen. This is holiness. I, I, I've spent too long on that. I should have been talking about righteousness. But it works out the same. For the righteousness of God is not only him doing what is right. A psalmist says, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. God is good. Another psalmist says, the Lord is good and he teaches everyone the way to walk in. God is good. God is, is pure. God is all of those lovely virtues that we talk about, we get up all the adjectives, we get up all the nouns, we pile them up, the Everest, the talk about him. We're doing well, but we know it's bigger than that. So God is a good guy. God is good. God is kind and caring. He's all of these things. He does what is right in keeping his word. Did he say he would? He does. If he walked in the door this minute, he would tell you. Here's what he, some of the things he would say. He would say, the human family chose alienation. We chose it. It's, it's, it's right to say sin alienates us. That's good scripture. Isaiah 59 says your sins and your iniquities have alienated you from God. That, that's true. It's more than that. That truth is not big enough to take in all the truth. For sin doesn't only alienate us. Sin is alienation. When we choose to sin, we are choosing alienation. And because God is the source of all that is fullness of life, when we choose alienation, we're choosing death. And God would come saying to us, I didn't choose alienation. I never wanted that. I don't want it now. I would never want alienation from the children I've created. God doesn't want alienation. Listen, listen. We tend to think. I, 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 that's a generalization. We don't all think this way. But we, we tend to think that we sin and God punishes us with alienation. When we sin, we alienate ourselves, and God acknowledges the alienation, and he comes because he has eternally purposed and is faithful to his commitment. I have come to reconcile you to myself. And Jesus Christ and the whole creation where God keeps giving us and giving us gifts, and he gave unto them life, breath, and everything else. Once more from earlier, why does he give all of those gifts? Why, why, why do these non-Christian uh, husbands and wives have these lovely little babies? Because God loves them for pity's sake. Why, why, why are these non-Christian people um, so upright? So honest in their job, and many of them, I mean mil millions of them, honest in their jobs. I have a friend who lives in Midland, a doctor fella, Joey Tilton. He is a colleague, told me that some years back. Hello. 
And I'm talking to you. There's a fellow come in there. He really hacks me off. Uh, that's a joke. That's a joke. He's a good friend. Uh, uh, what was I saying? Joy Tilton. Joy Tilton. I hate, I hate the way I do what I do. I can't help that. Joy Tilton said, I work with this fella. He's an agnostic. He's an agnostic, the guy. He said, I want to grow to be like him. You met non-Christians like that? You met people who treated you marvelously? Haven't we all at some point or another said, I'm better treated by people outside the church than I am in? Haven't we had that sad experience often? Listen, we are not the cream of the crop. We are people God has called, and we've been graciously blessed and brought into uh, fellowship with him, and he has given us a job to do. And we're doing it. We're not doing it flawlessly. He understands all that. He didn't call us to do it flawlessly. He just says, do it. Play the hands of God. Do what you can. Sing what you can. Say what you can. Act out what you can. But won't you commit to me? And we say, absolutely. So, we, ha we have a God who loves the entire human family and keeps his word to them because he made the commitment way back in the days of Noah, earlier than that. But in Noah, he said, see that up there? And there's this big spanned thing. And, they, and the scientists tell us, uh, that's a refraction of light on water droplets and all that. And we love it. And we're happy they know that. And we're happy, we're happy with anything the scientists give us that's really worthwhile. Thank God for scientists. Who wants to go back to this when there weren't any painkillers when you're getting your teeth ripped out? Who wants to go back to the days when there was no injections that, that helped? We don't want that. Those people are serving God even when they don't know it. God gives them these gifts. Ah, when some surgeon worked on my ethel, I didn't check out whether he was a religious man or not. I thanked God and I thanked him. And I have a very dear friend, has a, a little business. I don't know, 60, 70, 80 people he, uh, he hires. Um, uh, I'm a little bit reluctant to say this because I'm not dead sure. Um, I, I think he's outside, but I'm not not sure about it because we've been having nice talks. He, he was in Christ many years ago and all of that. But this is a lovely man. This is an honest man. He's a presence in his... Am I talking about God's righteousness or not? I, I don't know where I am now. Okay, here it is. And it's 3.35. 3.35. You thought it was 5 o'clock, didn't you? No. <laughs> I'm supposed to finish at a quarter. Tell us. Isn't that right? Is, isn't that right? Thank you, sir. Uh, um, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, th this fellow I'm telling you about him. He's a presence. If he's not there, that little company still acts his way. This is a lovely man. I wish I were as upright as this fellow is. But there it is. And uh, I'm saying that God loves the human family. He doesn't just give them breath to breathe. He doesn't just give them health. He just doesn't give them happy marriages and lovely homes and all of that. He gives them moral strength and right. Where do you think they get it from? They didn't get it from the devil. God aids them, shapes them, has them meet up with people who love God? Grandmothers, grandfathers, whoever. A little piece of paper fluttering, you pick it up, and there's a word of God on it, for pity's sake. And things start happening. You can't trust God. He sneaks up on you. <laughs> he comes at you. He comes at you from all those lovely, uh, you know, secret words. He comes at you, and you hear a hymn singing. E.O. Wilson, if he's still alive. Marxist, materialist. A geneticist, all of that, atheist to the core. He went to a gathering where Martin Luther King Sr. was speaking uh, in praise of Martin Luther King Jr. And that congregation got the singing. You know how some congregations can sing? And they were singing. And E.O. Wilson started to sob. 
And the newspaper guy saw it and came and said to him, what, an atheist, all of that? Oh, he said, oh, don't worry about it, he says. It was just cultural. Yeah, right. God was moving in on him. I don't know where he is today. But God was getting to him. God keeps his word. He's faithful. Romans 1. Now I'm finally getting to a text here. Rome, I come into my head is what I mean. Romans 1. Romans 1, 16. Here's Paul coming to Rome. The strongest, most powerful city in the world. And what's he coming with? He's got a sermon. Paul had only one sermon. Jesus was never out of his mouth. Here he comes to Rome and he said, I'm coming to Rome and I've got what's needed here. Oh, we think of the word dunamis there, you know, it's the power of God. We think dynamite blows up. That's not the point at all. That's not what dunamis, oh, never mind. He says, I'm coming and I'm coming with the gospel. And if you follow the King James Version and that text, Greek text, argue about it. I come in with the gospel of Christ or the gospel of God, chapter 1, verse 1. And what? He said, uh, it's the power, not coercive, drawing, wooing, convicting, all of those things that you know are involved in uh, that. Here he comes with his gospel, speaks a word, and the world changes yeah and he said it's the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes not just Jews as many of that church thought anyone who believes anybody can be saved and, and here's his rationale it's the power of God to save to everyone who believes unto the Jew first also the mm, he said for for a causal preposition. Here's his rationale. For God's righteousness is revealed in it. Yeah, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Righteousness is where you give a hundred cents, it's justice, you see. That's what we often think about it. We think the word righteousness and the word justice are the same thing, though they all come out of the same single Greek word. All is justification, just and righteous and the rest. All single one Greek word. It means what it means when he says what it means. And there he says, for in it, for in what? For in the gospel is what? God's righteousness. Not as retributive justice. The passage isn't a threat. It's a, an assurance. It's an assurance for in it, God's faithfulness is seen. And that's what draws people. And that's what brings, and he keeps his word. The righteousness of God is God doing what he said he would do. Don't you know people like that? Don't you know people, if they say to you, I, I will do it, you know they'll do it. You know, if they don't do it, you'll send flowers because they're either in hospital or they're dead. That kind of people. I mean, that kind of people, and they're all over the place. You may be married to one. Yeah, you, you maybe have a boy who is that, or a girl, your parent, some friend of yours who says, I will, and he will. Okay, so if he cannot, he cannot, or she cannot, but if it's doable and they say they'll do it, they do it, and God says, to you and to me. See her? See him? That's me. Now, I'm better, of course, but that's me. That is me. This is God revealed. And in Jesus Christ, we see it flawlessly done. The glory of God, says Paul. 2 Corinthians 3, on into chapter 4. We see the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. I, I worry. I'm the worrying kind. You think, well, he's only saying that. He, look, I'm a, you know, I'm a worrying kind. I'm incredibly insecure. I'm not bragging on it. I'm just telling you that's how it is. And I'm not lying to you either. This is me. If I think, if I saw some of you glaring at me, 
I'd start thinking about you, and I'd be even worse than I am now. Uh, on and on and on I'd go. I'd worry about, what did I say? Did I say something? Uh, have they heard something? That had worried me. You know, you know what really rings my own personal bell? And what rings yours too, I know, on, in a different uh, set of circumstances. I know that God has made a promise to me. I know that God has made a promise to me. And his promises, like his power, rise out and, oh, two minutes. His promise is an expression of his love. When you promise something for the future, you've done something about the future. There's a time coming when that will happen. And God has made a promise to me. I have loved you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will continue to love you. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. And that? Why then? What would I worry about? I only worry because I'm wired. That's all just reaction. My faith, like yours, is set on him, not on me. For we don't trust our faithfulness. We trust his faithfulness, his righteousness. Thank you for your patience. God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be merciful unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.